several years ago, I talked to a young man who's a member of St. John's Cathedral in Jacksonville, Florida, and he revealed to me the story about his mother and his favorite aunt, who is his mother's sister. Seems that they had had a break in their relationship decades ago. Harsh words had been said. There was enmity between the two of them, and when he was telling me the story, he told me that they had not spoken to each other for at least 20 years. He told me also that he had been praying for them over the course of some years, and it was encouraging each of them separately to bridge this gap and reconcile with each other. But it hadn't happened yet. He told me a couple months before telling me the story that his mother and his favorite aunt happened to be at the same gymnasium one morning, unexpectedly then saw each other across the room through the elliptical machines. <laughs> One decided then to get up, venture across the great divide in the gymnasium and go over and speak. They decided that they would have coffee together. He wanted me to know that that event went so well and there was so, such a reconciling spirit that for now several months they have been meeting every Friday morning for coffee at a Starbucks and that they're catching up with each other and they're forgiving each other and they're finding a great new relationship with each other. In June of 1981, I was ordained to the priesthood. Outside in the narthex before I walked in procession uh, with my bishop, who was also my, one of my mentors, I asked him, so I'm just a few minutes away from your laying hands on my head, what should I expect? I thought he might have something really sophisticated and deep, he might say, something about the Bible or about theology or about prayer. He simply said, in the coming years, you will not have to knock on very many doors or knock very hard and find out behind those doors resides pain and suffering and division. And you don't have to turn too many pages in the scripture before you and I find the same human dimensions. Only a few pages into Genesis is our text for today, our Old Testament reading, which Barbara read just a few minutes ago. It's a stark and stunning story of sibling rival rivalry, of family dysfunction, of pain and suffering and severe division. Let me recount how we got to the context of this story. You may know a little bit of it. You always hear the story of Jacob and Esau, but in fact, it should be the other way around. It should be the story of Esau and Jacob because he was born first, and that started the epic. Esau was born, and then a few minutes later, then Jacob was born. We're told in the story that Jacob actually grabbed Esau's heel on his way out of the womb. And from the time they took their first breath until today's story, life was not well with the twins. <laughs> there was enmity from the beginning. We're told Esau was born with, uh, that evidently then turned into a lot of hair, we're told. He was very hairy. And Jacob, not so much. A Hebrew scholar that I've read about this story said because he grabbed um, Esau's heel, then we should call them hairy and grabby. <laughs> well, you know, in their tradition, Jacob was not given anything as secondborn, and Esau was going to inherit the whole mother load. And Jacob felt cheated by that cultural and financial arrangement, 
And so what did he do? He cheated right back. He put a lot of hair on himself, went to his nearly blind father, Isaac, and received the blessing and the inheritance that belonged to his twin brother, Esau. Well, you can imagine that didn't go very well with Esau. So Esau was after his brother for years and years. He, call, he saw him as a cheat and as a manipulator and all kinds of other things. By the time we get to our story that's appointed for today, there's been decades of enmity. They didn't have a gem through which they could see a, an elliptical machine. Esau was camped with 400 soldiers. We didn't hear that part. They were ready to come and kill Jacob and all of his family, which was by that time considerable. He gets to the Jabbok River. He sends his whole family on ahead so that they can be safe, and then Jacob encamps there by the river Jabbok. And then a stunning event happens during the middle of the night. He doesn't run into Esau, at least yet, he runs into divine presence, a divine reality who cares immensely for him, cares about every head on his hair on his head, cares about his past, his present, and his future, the same divine presence that meets us every day. And they have a wrestling match all night by the river Jabbok. Towards the daybreak, Jacob is still holding on to this divine reality. That voice then says to Jacob, let me go. Jacob, who's always the fighter, said, I will not let you go until you give me a blessing. We don't know what this figure looked like, but this divine loving presence then said, I'm going to give you some blessings. One of them is not going to be so comfortable. So he takes his hip out of joint. <laughs> Doesn't sound much like a blessing, does it? And then he says, and I'm going to give you a new name. Your name is Jacob now. Your name now is going to be Israel. Israel, which means the one who wrestles. I'm going to give you a new identity. So God blesses Jacob at the river Jabbok. How did God bless Jacob? And then how do we glean some of its benefits for our own journey? Did God bless Jacob by giving him a new name and a new identity? Yes. Did God bless Jacob because he came to terms with his past? with bad decision-making, with guilt and remorse, with his flavor of being a cheat? Yes. Did God bless Jacob because he now had a new perspective on his twin brother? And he was going to go to his twin brother and ask for forgiveness? Yes. But I don't think those are the primary blessings that Jacob received. I believe he received two. One is he was given the blessing of humility. And secondly, he was given the blessing of a loving self-offering. A loving self-offering. The first blessing that Jacob received was the blessing of humility. Jesus talked a lot about this blessing, especially enacting that blessing the last night of his life on this earth. We call it Maundy Thursday. You'll remember that he had a place of honor, and he left that place of honor, and he moved around to the other side of the room, and he took the towel of the servant, put it in his belt, took a basin of water, and then he washed his disciples' feet. And he gave us the Maundy, the commandment, I want you to love one another, as I am loving you. How was Jesus loving them? How does Jesus love us? By being our servant, by taking a stooping posture. 
he met up with Jacob, who was full of himself and full of his own impression, full of his own wealth, full of his own hoarding and cheating, full of everything, and he transformed him, and he blessed him by giving him the gift of humility. So much so to where our text does not say it, but on into the next verses. He limps, remember the hip, he limps his way towards his twin brother and the 400 soldiers, and he goes and he confesses, and he asks for forgiveness, and he looked into Esau's face, and he said, brother, when I see your face, I see the face of God. I would say that he claimed his blessing of humility. But our society does not encourage this blessing, does it? Our society encourages us to be dominant, to be top of the hill, to be first, to rule, to hoard, to own, to all those things that somehow were superior to other people. Our culture does not encourage this blessing of humility. You may know the story of the perceived two warships who were in the middle of a night, foggy, you could hardly see over the bow, but they could faintly see on the flagship, they could faintly see an, another light, and of course they were ex exuding their own light. And one of the ensigns came to the admiral and said, Admiral, if we keep going on our regular course, we're going to collide with that light, with that other ship. The admiral got on the radio um, and said, hear, hear me, you must change your course by 20 degrees immediately. I'm the captain, I'm the admiral, he said. Voice came back and said, I'm an ensign. And we're not able to do that, Admiral. You'll have to change your course 20 degrees. Well, you can imagine the Admiral, full of all of his buttons and all of his uniform and all of his authority, then did one of those. He got back on the radio and he said, now hear this, I'm not only the captain of this flagship, I am the Admiral of the entire fleet. You." alter your course 20 degrees immediately. Voice came back and said, Admiral, I hear you. I'm afraid that's not possible. You see, I'm a lighthouse. <laughs> we have those moments, don't we? When we're full of ourselves. We're full of knowing everything, we're full of being superior to other people. We're full of our degrees and our possessions. We're, we're full of our station in life. We're full of our neighborhood and our church and our denomination. Whatever it is, we're full of ourselves and we're caught short, aren't we? God gives us some chastening moments. Oh, he doesn't press us down with an unloving thumb on our head to make us suffer. The God of love does not do that. But we are given, are we not, chastening experience where we go, wow, I, I guess I needed a bit of dose of humility. <laughs> Jacob shows us again this great gift, the stooping posture of the servant. And when we do, we live into the person of Jesus of Nazareth. God gave Jacob another blessing the blessing of a loving self-offering. Jesus also talked a lot about this time and time again. He said, I want you to find yourself in the back of the line. I want you to find yourself serving the neighbor. I want you to find yourself extending mercy to the lost and the least and the last. That's where you'll find me. He says over and over again. I want you, Jesus is saying, to see your life as a gift as a bountiful gift from God and that you have gifts and talents and resources and skills to give to the world. 
Thomas Cranmer said it best in his famous collect, to serve God and to serve neighbor is to find perfect freedom. You and I need a dose of freedom. And if you want some more freedom, the way you and I will find it is to serve God and neighbor. According to Cranmer and the teachings of Jesus, that's where we'll find ourselves and our purpose. That's where Jacob found his. That's where you and I will find ours. After all, we do say when the offering comes forward, it is better to give than to receive. It's the lifeblood of a journey of faith for you as individuals, for this wonderful congregation, Bethesda by the Sea. The whole lifeblood of a congregation is to be giving. It is in giving that you and I will find our life and find our purpose. Wallace Hartley, in 1912, was one of the best violinists in all of England. He was from Lancashire. He was a child protege. He was a stunning musician, even as a child. And as he grew into adulthood, he was sought after. He had many invitations to be the chief violinist. In his early 20s, he took on a side job like a lot of musicians, right, Dr. Forster? Because usually the main salary doesn't quite carry the day. And so he took a side job, was brought in a little extra money. In 1912, he was engaged to be married. A month out, he decided that he would sign on again for his side job. He thought, yes, this will work. It's just a 10-day over and back. It's just a short turnaround. So he signed on for his side job, believing that if I would have some new resources to take my young bride on a beautiful honeymoon. So he signs on, and he takes his gear and his violin and aboards the Titanic. He signed on as the chief violinist and as the head of the, the string quartet. You may know the story, but after that great ship hit the iceberg at 2 a.m. on April the 15th, 1912, the musicians were offered a lifeboat. They all refused, beginning with Wallace Hartley. They believed that if they kept playing their music, it would bring a calm to the souls of those who were now traumatized by a ship that was coming apart. They decided to go on deck. They kept playing and playing. They played until the boat cracked in half and was beginning to sink. By then it was too late for any of them to be saved. Two weeks later, as rescue ships were still moving in and out of the baggage and sadly the bodies, Wallace Hartley's body was found floating in the North Sea. He still had his tuxedo on, his black tie, he was still clutching his violin in its case when he was plucked out of the water. His fiancée was too brokenhearted to even meet the body. His father went down to the shipyards when they brought him in, and we're told that he wept. This wonderful, beautiful human being had given himself totally for the sake of others. This one who could have made music soar for Great Britain. A week later was his funeral in Lancashire. There were 1,000 people who came to his funeral, and the cortege that left the church to go to the cemetery 
was lined on the street by 40,000 people to say thank you, to bid him farewell, to weep, and to say what a self-offering, what a gift of love to stay on that boat and to play your beautiful music as the last remembrance of people on this earth. How about us? I'd like you to imagine today that this center aisle is the River Jabbok. We have a lot of things that happen in our life. As my bishop mentor said, you don't have to knock on too many doors or too loudly to find out behind every door is some trauma and some pain and some breakage. You don't have to go to a, a gym and look across an elliptic, uh, elliptic machine. I'd like you to imagine this is your river Jabbok, and week by week by week, you can have that kind of engaging encounter with the Holy One, and there you can determine again the blessings that you're receiving. Some of them will be chastening. We'll, we'll remind you of the past when you and I have made decisions that we regret. We carry around some guilt. We need to confess. And we also meet up with blessings. What are those blessings that we're given? The same ones that Jacob was given. The gifts and blessings of humility. To have a stooping posture, to kneel down or stand up at these rails and hold out our hands and receive the blessing of the holy meal. And then we're bid to go out and offer the second blessing, and that is to be a loving self-offering for those in need, here and out there, to extend ourselves, your gifts, your talents, your resources, to make a difference, to make a world of difference. Like Esau and Jacob, Jacob limping out from the river Jabbok, limping out and meeting up with his brother. You and I can see ourselves doing the same thing. We're not all perfect. We have some blemishes. We go out from here. We meet up with the needs of the world. And like Jacob, we look into those needs and into the faces of many hundreds of people who need the grace of God. And we say with Jacob, when I see your face, I see the face of God. <laughs>